it's seductive to be like, excellent, the only money guide I'll ever need. That that to me is a little bit deceptive, um, because how can one like how could you take advice from an author that's never met you? All right, so I want to welcome everybody to episode three or four. Four, I think. Episode four of the Investors Podcast. Um, our goal here is to give you guys a bit of an insight uh, into investing and, and, you know, what is it? What do we use it for? Um, and how you guys can start to think about it. Um, and we've got a really special episode today. Um, an episode that uh, we thought about, you know, and, and again, I think I just want to preface this first, right? So um, the, we obviously all respect the work that went into the book, The Barefoot Investor. And we also, there's a lot of the things in it that we agree with. Um, I think we just want to give a bit, uh, maybe a different point of view and, and kind of, you know, uh, have a conversation about it. One, because we know that um, it is probably the household book on finance management and wealth, you know, uh, building wealth in Australia. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely around the world as well. So um, we want to have a conversation around it, some things that we potentially agree with and some things that we don't necessarily um, agree with as well and then start to have that conversation. Um, so I guess some, we'll start with some of the things that we do agree with. And I think that there's the bucket system or the, the kind of the different accounts in a sense that you can, uh, that system that you can build to start to understand where money goes and get, a, I guess, a better grasp on, on your spending and, and how you can start to segment uh, your money so you can understand what it gets used for. Yep. Um, and I know that's something that you guys do as well. So I would start with... Did you have a slightly different view? I do, but I just think he he frames it in the wrong way because he sort of suggests that you have, what is it, it's uh, your blow um, account, um, then Mojo, and then finally uh, your investment one grow. at the end. Yeah, yeah. grow, that's the yeah. one. And there's um, a splurge or something too, isn't there? Yeah, but so within that blow one, he's got the four different um, accounts and it, it emphasises your your everyday expenses first, then it has your splurge one, um, has your emergency fund, and then there's uh, like, I don't know, a travel one or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just think the way that he frames it, he frames it in a way that I think, I think we should be prioritising the grow first mm. and then our mojo like the emergency fund i think we should instead of prioritizing our spending accounts yeah we should be prioritizing the saving first yep. and so i don't like how we set it up in that way yeah i, I would agree i'd completely agree probably yeah. not i'd always have the the safety element first because yeah, i think yeah. that is that what you mentioned yeah so yeah. i thought i had that yeah. the other way around um because I think that's the thing that gives people the ability to think clearly about the other stuff. It's yeah. like, all right, as long as you know that you've got, you know, for, for you, I'd imagine it's more like one month. <laughs> for <laughs> for like other people, two like days, six months. <laughs> uh, depending on who you are, whatever time frame that is, knowing yeah. that you've got that up your sleeve allows you to, you know, really just drop the cortisol levels in your bloodstream so you can see things as they are. Um, but I'd completely agree with. Yeah, well, I'm I'm highly things. liquid, so obviously, yeah. like, yeah, you know, invest it's in easily equities, gettable. I can get yeah. it really quickly. Yeah. Whereas if you have yeah. property, yeah, not so easy. Yeah, but I just, yeah, I don't, I don't understand his premise of focusing in on your expenses first, because the way that I have sort of taught myself is to prioritize your your savings, mm. or in my case, my investments. Uh, and then whatever you have left over is what you can then spend and you make adjustments to your lifestyle accordingly. Yep. Yeah, we, we talk about Parkinson's law a lot and I think you know, that's leveraging that where it's like you're controlling supply to regulate your demand. Mm. Um, so, you know, you eat a lot when the fridge is full. Mm. Guess what? If the fridge is less full, you tend to eat less. Yeah. So if you invest first, then it's easy for you to live off the rest than it is for you to try to live off this much so you can save this much. Mm. And just eat, it's a, it kind of works against the way we're wired. Yeah. Yeah. I can see where he's coming from because it's kind of paying attention to the lead action, like the thing that they're controlling and the things that they're mm. like doing to create the saving. Well, that's what I'm learning from you guys today is that you, it, it should be something that you prioritize, obviously, tracking those expenses that you do have uh, day to day. And I guess by having those separate accounts, it allows you to do that. Yep. 
yeah. well that's well that's true like being intentional with how you're spending and just being um you know, purposeful with how you're allocating your resources mm. means you'll you'll end up with more right yeah. you'll end up yeah. getting more value from your money you know extracting more value from as it moves through your life you'll also be able to invest more but when it comes to the order and the priorities like you mentioned mm. i still agree that uh, prioritizing investing before spending mm. yeah. is the right way around because uh it, it creates, like Terry said, when the fridge is full and you're kind of just hoping that there's going to be some left at the end of the month, for example, you're just hoping. Like you, you and that, with that's the, the whole premise of his buckets thing. It's like it, once they start overflowing, that's when they start to pile into yeah. uh, this, this mojo. And then, uh, and then even from then, then once that mojo starts to overflow, then it finally goes into the one that you're growing. And yeah. I just think that's, that's not a path that's going to get you to your long-term goals. No, it's, it's, working a, it's, work, it's relying on a bit of willpower. I know that these kind of like you know, prescriptions and it's just like automate this, automate that, automate this. But, um, you know, if those things don't work out, that is relying on you to sort of be like, well, let's squeeze this down to have some left. And um, that's just not how it works. Like, mm. your desires have no end. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to create the, con- the, the constraints mm. um, and then you work out how to live, live within those. Mm. Do, do you think that he's written this book with the majority in mind, right? So, so like, you know, Australian culture, get a house... That's the Australian dream, in a sense. Yeah, well, it's a book, and right? I, and the I, only way you make money from a book is to make it sellable to the masses. Yeah. So that's what we need to preface. Like, he's done a great job of mm. s- selling and starting the conversation between the masses and, I guess, we're, we're kind of, I guess, adding some nuance to it. And, and this is going to take it away from the masses. Yeah. I think that, the, I guess, the, the problem that I see with it, right, is that it almost... It, like you know, if it, like think about how many people got come into this without actually knowing what you guys were talking about before, which is what success is to them. Mm. And instead, this book can somewhat paint what that success should look like to that person, especially because of the success that it's had. And you know what? Like uh, you can't take away from that because he didn't choose for it to be that successful. He wrote it with that in mind. But the reality is, I think what happens now, and I guess. The reason I thought it was a good idea to have this conversation is to say that if you are looking into going on this journey, that that is not the only way to do it and to understand what that goal is. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, because some of the the things that we've talked about previously is like, you know, paying down your mortgage as quick as you can, upping your super from, you know, to I think, what, 10, 11% to that 15%. Mm. You know, that's something that he says to do. Like, put all your money in super. Yeah. Pay off your house as quick as you can. And I get it, like, for a majority of people, that is the Australian dream. But... It's actually... Who wants to be told? If you want to be told, mm. there you go. Um, but if you want to think for yourself, then you actually got to think for yourself. <laughs> but <laughs> like, do people know whether they want to be told? Uh, I don't know. Like, it's it's seductive to be like... Excellent. The only money guide I'll ever need. That that to me is a little bit deceptive, um, because how can one like how could you take advice from an author that's never met you, mm. doesn't know your situation, doesn't know your history, doesn't know your money stories, doesn't know your capabilities, your potential, any of those things, your dreams, your ambitions. So you've got to accept that that is your vision. You've got to assume that that is your vision now, um, and if that's fine, that's fine. For, that's awesome for you. Mm. Um, but I guess the people that we work with tried that and realized that actually isn't designed for us. Um, we're a little bit different, and so that didn't work for us. And that's the reason we started our thing, is because we had a lot of people coming to us going, we tried it, we couldn't stick to it. And a huge part of it is not feeling the conviction to actually create it, yeah? Like, doing money for money's sake, like getting organized, setting those things up, uh, if you can't see what it's going to create you, uh, create for you in the future, then it's not going to be something where you kind of you you hit the the rocky part and stick to it. Yeah, you don't kind of stay the course. It's easy to fall off that track. Mm. So, what we find with that is, like, it's a great, it's such a great starting base to say, all right, yep. here are some principles that you can leverage, but now you've got to personalize it and adapt it to what you want to create and how it kind of aligns with your values as well. Um, mm. Because if it's not, uh, it's not serving you in terms of moving you closer to where you want to be then you're not going to stay on it. So, so why wouldn't someone... So, okay. Um, did you have something bef- based on that? that no, you you to, so, so my, my question is this, is 
why wouldn't someone want to pay down their mortgage you know quicker you know like why wouldn't someone want to go and do that like because because you take that you take that word and you know if you're reading this book and you kind of that's your gospel on how to manage your finances why wouldn't somebody want to pay down their mortgage more or even you know put more into their super well i'd say they do want to pay down their mortgage quicker um it's more just about what they're doing that for. So it's not just to say, you know, I'm not going to buy my house and spend the next 20 years paying down my mortgage, it gets to zero, and then start to think about how do I build up my super. Like most people are more ambitious than that and they want to be able to make moves sooner. So oftentimes it's just that, you know, I'm paying down the debt to get it to a point where I've actually got the equity available in my home to make the next move. And I think that's what kind of gets missing, like it gets missed, it gets skipped over is what is the next move? Like what's yeah. the um, what's the kind of wealth creation strategy that sits beside it yeah. um, as opposed to just simplifying it down to just that and saying that's all you need to know. Like just pay down the mortgage and once you hit that, yeah. you're going to own your home and, and then focus on super. I, yeah, I find that part just a little bit patronising. Just follow the prescription and you'll get to heaven because I just, you know, with the way I designed heaven is that's what it is that's your paid off home and this or this is this and i know that's not exactly what he's saying but it's kind of like it's implied almost you know that's what you're capable of well actually there are a lot of people capable of a lot more and um we only know that if we demand it of ourselves well if you actually um, do the numbers so if if you subtract that additional payment and you contribute that to uh your super or an investment vehicle outside of that um that person may end up paying their house off with those additional payments. They may end up may, uh, paying it off after, say, 20 years, and then they start to rapidly try to accumulate their wealth. Yeah. But compounding's already gone against them. Exactly. Mm, you yeah. know, so if you start that off straight away, mm. um, over the course of those 30 years that you're paying off that house, you'll have the equity within the home, and it's completely paid off. But after the 30 years, if you contribute that extra $5,000 a year onto... Um, onto an investment vehicle. Yep. By the time, yeah, that that pa- that house is paid off, you might have like it could have accumulated up to the the five hundred thousand mm, yeah. range. Mm. Time actually works against your wealth that way. Yeah. Um. And and I guess you know we were just talking about the way in like our our view is different. Mm. I think you should wait until time's working for you first. So get some money in the market, get an income, growing income stream, start growing your wealth. And then go and buy your house. Oh, my only regret is not starting earlier. Exactly. I started at 16. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Jesus. Yeah. I, I, I wish I started <laughs> Mate, earlier. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But time is your asset. Yeah. You know, it when is. It, when time it comes is the to asset. This. Yeah. yeah. And it's either your it's your ally when you act sooner, but it's your enemy when you wait. Yeah. And um, inaction is the killer of, of your financial freedom and yeah. creativity and all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think going back to like thinking about like the options that people have there, right? It's like one, just pay off the mortgage, don't do anything else. Two, it's redirect the extra money that you put on the mortgage to somewhere else and invest it. But what probably people miss the most is like there's the third option, which is pay off the mortgage, then use the equity to buy the next thing, mm. which just shifts that debt from, you know, that non-deductible home loan debt that you mm. can't claim the interest as a tax deduction uh, and shifts it into tax deductible investor debt. Mm. Which is better, and it's stuff that let, you want to let me hold explain that for the for for people. It's like converting fat to muscle. Your converting mortgage, to muscle. your mortgage yeah. is fat, and when you take it to an investment loan, it's muscle. Well, look, and people don't realize that your first home, the the home that you live in, isn't technically an asset. Yeah, so that's where careful. they fall into the careful. trap. Careful, <laughs> <laughs> careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, they don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that that's exactly right. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes when it's oversimplified, uh, you just create that correlation that debt is bad yeah but debt is an accelerant of building wealth yeah like you use it to speed things up and so i think when it's oversimplified and you kind of skip over teaching the nuances with that yeah then people kind of feel like they know they know everything there is to know and then they don't ask the next questions yeah. of you know this what's is the next layer this is exactly right like you know someone uh someone in in, uh, in my family read the barefoot investor and will no longer listen to anything at all Oh, I'm really? like, you actually stopped learning because yeah. you read the only money guide you ever need. <laughs> and um, he's now convinced he knows everything he needs to know. Yeah. And I'm like, um, I can see about five massive holes in your thinking. And now he's planning his mother's retirement. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, oh, this is so misleading in that sense, you know. Um, I agree it's that it's a great starting point. 
but then you need to continue learning. Yeah. You know, because finance is one of those things. There's there's so many nuances. There's so much you can learn in that space. And if you just stop after reading that, you, you're setting yourself up for failure, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's it, it creates ideology, right? Mm. Um, because you know, why do people why do people um, uh, make a comparison here? But why do people love, uh, I guess, like faith and religion and those kind of things? Because it's a really black and white set of rules, which means I don't have to think. I just follow the rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I guess in that sense, like if that's what you want to not think about it and just follow the rules and be okay, it's probably going to be okay. Mm. Um, but you won't realize what you're capable of. Um, y- you might not reach your potential. Mm. Uh, and, and I guess that's the trade off you've got to make. Stop thinking and settle for less. Yeah. Um, or actually keep digging, keep pulling on the thread. Um, and find out a little bit more about this whole game that we're all Well, playing. I think that's what uh, Robert Kiyosaki did well with the Rich yep. Dad, Poor Dad. Yep. He didn't give you a, a, a basically a checklist of what you need to tick off, yep. but he he gave you something that spurs um, that, that need to sort of learn a little bit more about yep. it, and then that's where he follows it up with the cash flow quadrant and all yep. these sort of things. Uh, and that allows you to, to continually learn and want to get interested in this space. And I think that's where the barefoot investor does it wrong. He sort of gives you this guideline of what you're supposed to do, but then doesn't follow it up with anything. Mm. You know? mm. Yeah, well, uh, you know, to actually to his credit now, he is financial counselling people, so he's in the trenches with people. Yep. But prior to that, he was selling books. Mm. Um, and he was an advisor, was he? I think he was. I sure. hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, I, you know, think I think in that sense he yeah. is following up now and he is kind of you know down in the weeds with people and, and you know working through their specific scenarios um, but financial counselling I think is a lot around advocacy and helping people get out of debt and that kind of thing yeah. so mm. um, I guess he's kind of dedicating himself to to that to that audience mm-hmm. um, I think that's important to note as well when he was writing that book he would have had a certain person in yeah. mind yeah. like yeah. you do when you're creating any content yeah. and it's likely to be that sort of 20 to 30 year old that doesn't have too many moving parts with their life because you know that prescriptions like percentage bases fall down as soon as life changes basically mm. and um and you also know that kind of as you evolve and as your priorities change uh, sometimes that actually limit that limits some of your growth as well to kind of stay within some of those boundaries where you should have mm. flex in the system mm-hmm. sometimes and you should be investing more in yourself and you should be aggressively doing that yeah um and so, like, that's where the rules fall down. Like, it's you got to think for yourself. Like, what stage of life am I at? What am I trying to achieve? Mm. And what should that mean about how I'm going to manage the thing called money? Yeah. It's well, we, we noted um, on a podcast a couple of weeks ago that we said, um, say you've got ten thousand dollars to invest, a ten percent return on that is only going to be a thousand dollars. Yeah. You can make more of a difference to your financial health focusing on on your expenditure uh, your debt that you've got and that mm. sort of thing it's not until you start to have hundred thousand and more that it starts to make a real difference in your life because a ten percent return on hundred thousand is ten thousand dollars that's yep. when you start to make a real difference yeah so it's when you're at those sort of lower amounts it, it is you need to focus in on on your spending and then getting those good habits when it comes to putting away money and and focusing on that growth factor yeah yeah, it's a, it's a sprint to 100K. And that's what we kind of focus on. Like our philosophy around that is invest in yourself first because that's mm-hmm. going to be a far greater return than anything else you, you invest in. Yeah. Invest in your business yeah. uh, because you know, you're know you looking to get a 30% return if it's profit or a 1,000% return if you're marketing. Mm. Um, you inve- And then you invest in other people's businesses, you know, which yeah. you, is around that 10%. Yeah. 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 So you've kind of got that hierarchy. And it's not one than the other. It's a... It's a balance of the whole, yeah. Uh, but what helps with that third one, which is investing in other people's businesses, which is purely passive and you're not trading your time and your talent for it, is you've invested in yourself yeah. and then potentially you've in, your, in your business yourself. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to become more valuable. Yeah, um, exactly. Otherwise, you need to be very frugal to yeah. get to that hundred k to exactly. start with. Exactly, and that's, that's yeah. I see a lot of that in the fire. Like people just making mm. their lives smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and saying like, "What's the least I can earn to pay the least tax?" I'm like. Oh, like, it's just so you're not a big fan of the fire <laughs> fire oh, no. movement. I think the the philosophy love it. Like get on get on get on top of your money. But where it goes wrong is when people, like I said before, um, mistake the the means for the end. 
and it's just all about I'm gonna get my net worth to this number. Like if you if you, if you do pull on the thread and you keep following people, you'll see that a lot of them do get to whatever their number is. And then they go to therapy. <laughs> yeah, well, they're too frugal with themselves. Yeah. And they've, again, they've developed this uh, bad relationship with money. Yeah. You know, they they realize they've traded their time, yeah. which is their most precious asset, mm. for money. Yeah. And they're like, it actually hasn't been worth it because there are some things you can only do now. Mm. Um, and you shouldn't wait to have those experiences because you'll only regret it later on. Mm. And so, like, I love this guy, Bill Perkins. He's written this book called Die With Zero. And he's basically saying the purpose of money is for you to convert your time and talent into experiences because experience is the only thing you can take with you. Absolutely. And so there are periods in your life where only some experiences are available to you. You've got health when you're young. So you can, I can go down the black run six times, six, seven, eight times, nine times in a day. Um, you know, when I'm 25, I can probably only do it three times when I'm 45. But I've got to pay the same money. So my money buys me less at 45 than 25. So you're telling me that I shouldn't do it when I'm 25? No, mm. I should do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just really not as simple as like follow this step follow this step follow this step um, I think that's the thing that I, I look at it right I look at it as a as a 27 year old and even, it's funny like I go sit to my accountant you know he's great at what he does but it, it, you know I sit there and I go I'm 27 or, you know I've, I can risk I can take the risks I can do all these things but I look at my friends and they read this book and they, they just pigeonhole themselves into this position yep. because they think this book is the gospel. And I'm yep. like, well, you know, I'm like, I think about you know, the money that I put in my, my super, you know, I don't have a self-managed super or anything like that. So, you know, I'm putting it into, uh, you know, a super fund that might get me an 8% return. Yeah. And it's like, you know, 5% of my, my, my wage potentially, you know, could be going into another investment. Exactly. And, and yeah. you know, yeah, I am willing to, research i am willing to learn i'm willing to do those things but i'm willing because i can think critically about that book yeah Yeah, i've read that book i sat down and did that with my partner three or four years ago but only because i'm curious i would say but also able to think critically and say yeah that's not going to take me to where i want to go my goal is not the australian dream of owning a home and that's it yeah you know i've got and i like to read into these businesses but Obviously, it's dependent on the person, but I think the thing that I look at it and go, well, the reason I want to have this conversation is to create more awareness for someone who's actually Mm. maybe read that book or might be thinking about reading that book saying that, hey, be careful because, you know, just putting extra money into your super and paying the mortgage down may not be taking you to where you want to go. And and just putting blind faith, as you said, into that that resource. Mm. I like the way the Buddha did it. He's like, hey, here's a set of principles that worked for me. But it's just a life raft to get you from one side to the next. Do not pick up my life raft and carry it with you the rest of your life. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people do. They, they're picking up this life raft and going like, yep, that's it. That's all. That's all. I've got it all. I've got all the answers. <laughs> and um, so I don't think it's necessarily all of um, the author's fault. I think it's people want to cling to that stuff and mm. stop thinking. Um, but I do disagree with that messaging. The only money guide you'll ever need. Um, I would just say that that's... Um, There's more responsibility that should yeah. be had there. Yeah. Yeah, like that's the reality. It's like, you know, yes, it's it's a marketing plea and we all do it. Like, you know, hands That's up. good marketing. It's Don't great marketing. That's actually great marketing because it speaks straight to my lizard brain. Shit, yeah. Just got to read the one book. It's actually fun. It's entertaining. It's well written. And now I'm done. And he plays into our the Australian culture of being really conservative as well, I yeah. suppose. Not really taking that risk. Yeah. Living the Australian dream, owning your home, yeah. and that sort of thing. What, what would you guys say to you know? We're kind of saying, you know, I've got different dreams. Like if I put myself in the in the shoes of a um, an observer, let's say, what would you say to someone who's sitting there saying, yeah, whatever, mate. Like you're arrogant. You think you're better than us. Is that what is that what we're saying? Because I don't think that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you as the observer are better. Yeah, I, I'm saying the observer should. <laughs> I think I'm people saying are, I think people there's, are there's capable of way more. On offer. Oh, there's there's more fruit on offer if you're willing to go and do the research. Yeah. You know, like it, even to the point I'll go and look at like someone like Kathy Woods who owns ARK Invest, who owns an ETF. So even if you're a passive investor, year on year she's getting what, 25% returns? So if you were to take that extra 5% that you were putting in to your super and, you know, the extra a um, 1000 bucks a month that he says to pay down your home loan and put that into an ETF of ARC or something of that nature, you know, you could get that 25% return and compound that 
at a, a, a serious rate. You know, these are stats, these are facts mm. that we're, we're putting in front of you of their performance. And it's like, for me, it's like that isn't, that's just an awareness thing for the, the person who's investing their money. You know, mm. they don't necessarily, because they're not willing to go outside of those realms and, and maybe use their time more effectively mm. to go and do the, this research, like you, there's, there's, there's so much more fruit on offer there. Um, if you're willing to go and do that. Now, I think the point I'm, I, I really am trying to make as someone who has probably read that book and, and you know, taken the other path is that l- looking at that book as gospel or just, just kind of saying that this is the only way to do it is pigeonholing you into a goal that may not be your end goal. Yeah, that's and, what and, I'm saying. I'm saying see more in yourself. Exactly. Yeah, you're 100%. actually way more capable. There's there's a historian, Will Durant, and he said the number one insight, this is the smartest guy who's read all the history ever, and he's the best at summarizing it. And someone said, what's the number one insight from history? And he said, man is capable of insane things if we'll only create the demand. And we, yeah, we're um, more resilient than we realize. Yeah. You know, we, we can take knocks um, better than what we actually think we can. Yeah. And we always tend to bounce back. Yeah. You know, and so even if you do suffer from a short term financial hit, you can come back from it. Mm. You just have to learn from it and then pivot. Yeah. You know, and this has been something we've just been discussing more so with the resource in our business, right? But Mm. it's still the same concept is uh, sometimes it's better off knowing that something doesn't work than wondering if it does. Mm. Just so that's more valuable. So so those hits along the way, and some of those, you know, it's the same with the idea of failures in business. Is you figured out what doesn't work, so there's less things that you have to consider that will work. Yeah, Yeah. and it's easier to find the things that do. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's from Nassim Taleb. Is like disconfirmation is more valuable than confirmation. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, you you only do that by trying stuff. You only do that's that by it. having a go. And you need to have skin in the game as well yeah. because that's when everything changes. It's one thing to talk about something, but until you actually yeah. have skin in the game and you actually follow through with something, yeah. you're never going to learn from those. Which I think that's Durant's major insight is like raise the stakes for yourself to yeah. see what you're capable of basically because they're the things you look back on and go, all right, you know, that gave me meaning. You know, that was fulfilling. I saw, you know, an element of mastery within myself and uh, I'm proud of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've always been that person who, like, you always have to touch the stove to see if it's hot. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're a thrill seeker. Fly too yeah. close to the yeah. sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you, know, you got to find out what works for you, and and you only do that by trying a bunch of stuff. Um, and I, that's the same with money. It's the same with your career. All those kind of things. It's not. It's not just like yes, that's the one way. It's just easy. It's simple. And you know, for some people, that's actually what you want. That's awesome. That is the best thing for you to do yeah if owning your home is the thing that you want to do and then prioritize that you know no you don't think so well like for me being an equity guy i understand completely that equity is not the be all end all and i know that obviously i take a lot more risk than what other people do as well but if you invest like i don't understand why people think that investing into an etf that tracks the top 500 companies as a risk, like having money invested in the stock market. Why is that risky to some people? Well, because they, when when they think the stock market, they think boiler room, someone selling me an individual stock on a penny stock. The Wolf of Wall Street. You know, that's what they're thinking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is now, it's it's almost as easy as banking. Like another bank account, it's just one that pays your high interest and other people get to use your money to make better goods and services for society and then you get paid back for it. Yeah. So you just get to harness other people's human endeavor when they wake up and think of better ways to do more with less. Yeah. Humans have only ever done that. That's why I've got more computing power in my pocket than the entire US government had 30 years ago. Human endeavor. Yeah. So you can bet on that like with one transaction and then forget about it. Mm. Like That's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. It's not that hard. I think going back to your comment around risk, like it just purely comes down to what their perception is or their understanding of it is. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as you understand how an index fund works mm. and what it captures, you know, human endeavor, human consumption, mm-hmm. yeah. and you understand it from a philosophic level, 
mm. then it doesn't feel risky. For me to invest in an index fund is is not a risk. Yeah, yeah. the risk is not putting it in and, and leaving it in cash, for yeah. example, yeah. and yeah. seeing that waste away over time. Mm. So it's more about you know how you understand it, how you yeah. see how those moving pieces change over time. Yeah, and also opportunity costs. Mm. Yeah, like uh, the opportunity cost of not taking action, yeah. what that results. I in. suppose we all spend time in this space, so we're aware of of what's happening behind the scenes and that sort of thing. But like, if you knew how we levered up the banks were, you'd never leave your money in the bank, <laughs> you know? In, the ca- in your cash. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, they won't go down though. No, well, not yeah. with the, the yeah. government backing them, but yeah. still, like they're taking so much risk on your behalf. Mm-hmm. With your money. With your money, <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. can I... Can I um <laughs> yeah, you're right. So for me, you said the thing that, that was important before was perception. And that was kind of what I was playing on before is like most people... It's like they're given this perception that, you know, owning your own home is success. So, like, the whole notion of, you know, if you want to own your own home, then so be it. But I think the problem is, is that that's what people tie to success or wealth or whatever this end goal is without actually understanding if that's truly what they, not necessarily if it not, it, not if it's truly what they want, but is that going to get them the feeling that they're looking for? Like, the example yeah. is, is like, you could have someone who, you know, they might have a, com- a family that has a combined wage of 120000 a year or something of that nature, and they literally live week to week paying down this home loan for their whole life because they believe that's going to give them the feeling that they want only to, un- to miss out on all of these experiences like maybe family holidays, maybe you know, uh, travel, maybe um, you know, w- whatever it is because they, they believed in this perception that this owning their own home was going to give them the feeling of potential freedom or whatever it is that they're trying to get. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that I, th- I don't like about this is like I don't necessarily think that that's going to get them to where they want to go. And I think they're given this perception by books like this, by, by, by the by Instagram m- by and everybody and posting. As well. Just, yeah. you know, the sold sticker on the home. And it's like it becomes this competition of who can own their own home first or how many, how many um, homes do you own? Yeah. When in reality, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Like, you know, it's funny. Like, you know, these conversations are had around kitchen tables around like, you know, you've got to own your own home by 30. Otherwise, you're not successful or, or these kind of things. And in reality, it's like, we talk about it as well as like, you know, whether you've got $100,000 of, of equity in an index fund or $100,000 of equity in a home, that's $100,000 of equity. Now, yes, there's re- different returns and these kind of things, but I think that's what gets missed mm. is that assets are assets that get you returns. There is no one pillar for success. And I just think that that sometimes can be, yeah. it, can, it can lead people and bring these external pressures, right? That, that you know, these are the things that make people unhappy. Yep. Yeah, like why don't I have a home by on the time I'm 30? Is that, you know, is there something wrong with me? Am I, you know, I, am I not successful? It's like, yeah, well, guess what? If you weren't just trying to save $100,000 for the next 10 to 15 years, knowing that that money is going to be able to buy less because of inflation over time, because you didn't listen to that, uh, that dream... You might have had a shot. You might have been able to get, go on a family holiday. You might have been able to take your kids to Disneyland. Mm. You might have been able to do all these things, but the reality is because they're given this perception of success and then, again, like S- Scott Pope and, and the book. Scott it's Pope. Pete, what's his <laughs> name? Pape. 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 All right. <laughs> oh, Done my research. <laughs> but because... Because it, there's the fuel to the fire of this perception that is success of owning your own home, they miss all these other avenues that potentially could have given them these life experiences that yeah. they actually yeah, wanted yeah, that was yeah. going to make them feel that way. And I think what that comes from is, well, the first thing I'd say is like people wanting to have their own home and, and that um, believing that it will give them that feeling. There's a portion of people that is absolutely true, yeah? And they've adopted that from their parents. But then you've also got a big portion that, you know, value flexibility, value things like travel and creating more of those experiences. They're not homebodies and they always want to be out creating, um, you know, more memories basically, having more adventures. But they're getting social pressured towards following this path. And Mm. if they don't follow that path, then like you mentioned, you know, they've hit 30. You're not a real adult. And yes, Mm. they've traveled, you know, they've lived in overseas for a couple of years. They've had all of these amazing experiences 
but then they're in a place where they're comparing themselves to friends or you know whoever it is out there that um, has their home and they don't and that's going to become that I guess that scorecard and that <clears throat> like we we challenge that a lot you know when whenever we do that our first session with people it's called life by design it's really clearly mapping out and articulating what it is they want to create in the future and getting underneath the feeling that that creates for them it amazes me that home is always you know it's one sixth or one eighth of the whole picture and it's all the other things that kind of bring together that gives them gives them that experience mm. so you kind of just need to know that yes it's a part of it but where does it fit in and, and when don't drown everything out because of just that one thing yeah. it's hard not to get sucked into that scorecard though I'm, oh, I, yeah. turned, Super hard. I turned 30 earlier this year and I just remember like I had this point where I sort of had some self-reflection I was like shit am I am I doing the right thing yeah you know I, and yeah. you start comparing yourself to others like yeah. uh, like I'm single so like I start to think oh shit I'm so far away from like settling down having a family and all that sort of thing and it's it's so hard to escape though yeah. It's, it's huge when you're in business for yourself as well because I yeah. think you make so many sacrifices along the way where like there's kind of this linear progression you make in a career whereas in a business it's more like a roller, clo- a roller coaster. Yeah. And, uh, business is hard, isn't it? It's hard. Like, yeah. It is hard. Um, and there's times where you go, am I doing the right thing? Should I have just stayed on that what people would call a safe, easy kind of you know, Time closes linear. on you, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, am I, you know... You look at it's very easy to look at the the extreme success in the world um, and the ages that it happened at and go, have I failed? You know, have I done the wrong thing to invest in the business not to get it to this level? Mm. Um, you know, that's one of the pressures that you can feel, especially when you're around other business owners a lot and you kind of see their success. You go, mm. what am I doing wrong? Am I mm. not at that level? All of these kind of these external pressures, these thoughts go through your head. Um, and you know, in reality, it's it's those those it's those thoughts that can break you down. They they can be yep. the reason that you are failing. You, mm. You're making wrong decisions, or decisions in business that are not best for the business, but instead trying to join the ego race. Mm. Um, and and you know that affects the way you you, you definitely make decisions and mm. your psychology. It's always that, like you know, I love Naval Naval Ravikant's kind of way of looking at it. He's like pursue wealth, not status. Mm. And status is what you can see. Wealth is what you can't see. Gary V emphasizes that too. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, I think he get like 60% of the questions he gets is from people in their 20s uh, asking him like, I don't have everything figured out just yet. And they feel like they're behind. Mm. And he always just prefaces that they're still so young, mm. you know, and you should be out there just accumulating experience, upskilling yourself and, and getting those sort of things under your belt. Because eventually you will event, um, figure it all out for yourself. And even at 30, even at 40, like you still have so much time when yeah. you think about it um, from the from a long-term perspective. It's just hard that like we are conditioned all the way through school not to fail. But the way to win is to, to lose. Oh, yeah. Um, and <laughs> Schooling is so <laughs> yeah, backwards, and, and, and coming back to the topic, right, I think what's seductive about the simplicity of this whole thing is this, here's how not to lose. Yeah. But you won't win. That's exactly the problem. I, I have a massive problem with that. Yeah. Because it's how not to lose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hundred percent. And you're right. You you'll never win because mm. like there's always something else. Yeah. You know. And that's if, an easy sell because yeah. that's the limbic. That's your animal brain going. I'm actually really interested in certainty because I think certainty is safety. Mm-hmm. Um. And so yeah, I want that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I'm trying to avoid uncertainty yeah. rather than. You know, but, but you know, in the markets, but uncertainty, like we would, we've, we've been having this discussion in terms of the business side of things like you, the reason you get paid more is because of uncertainty. The reason, um, Assuming risk. The, the risk side of things, like you're not guaranteed a return, but you are guaranteed learning. And if you are attentive to the learning, you can stack the learning on top of itself to create wisdom. And then you can use your wisdom to create wealth. Um, it's just that people don't want to lose. And they don't want to look like they're failing. And like we said, that's actually the only way. Like we've been trying to speed up failure in our business. I I don't think we're failing fast enough. I'm like, we've got to figure out ways to find out what doesn't work faster. Um, Love that. That's so good. It's like be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. You know? And, and, you know, like that's that's what taught, you know, 
biggest thing for me with that was separating entities. The business's money is not yours. Yeah. Because you're willing to spend it even if you're losing. Mm. Yeah, you're willing to spend it to lose because you understand what didn't work. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, but if you believe that that money is yours and that's the relationship you have with it, yep. you have this scarcity mindset, you will progress at a slower rate no matter yep. what level of business you're at. The thing that will always hold you back from going to that next level is that relationship with money. Yeah. You know, the way you spend it, the decisions, you know, the way you grow a business is allocating capital to achieve a certain strategy to get to a certain goal. Mm. Now, if if you're breaking down at the way you spend capital, yeah. like that's the biggest thing from going from a singular business owner, a self-employed person to then having a team. The, di- the, the dynamic completely changes and the way you hire staff, who you hire, how you hire, all of this stuff is affected by your relationship with money and how you spend it and that carries into your business as well. So that's been the biggest eye-opener for me. Probably only just started to get a good grasp of it now, understanding how to allocate that money to the strategy. May, you know, uh, that strategy has to be the correct one, the one yeah. that's going to get me there, which is a game in itself, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but to, towards this end goal, to where we're trying to go, to what we're trying to achieve, to the purpose we're trying to fulfill. I heard a great quote the other day from Jesse Meacham, and he's, he wrote the book called You Need a Budget. Great book. Um, and he said, show me your business outflows and I'll show you your business strategy. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty spot on, I reckon. Like you can pretty much tell what your strategy is. You know what your philosophy is if you just look at what you're spending and how you're spending it. Um, 100%. Yeah. It's an art though. It's, it's one of those things that you just so have to constantly be playing with. Yeah. So key takeaways, if you're going to read The Barefoot Investor, it's not that you, you shouldn't, but if you're going to read it, what do, you, what, what do we have to kind of... I reckon definitely read it if you're 22, single, on a fixed income, and your life's super simple, because I did. It was awesome, awesome for that, but then don't stop. Mm. Yeah, keep reading. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep kind of getting those books, you know, reading those articles, looking into other ways and, and research, rather than just kind of saying, yep, that's it, and then, and then finishing up there. Yeah. Yeah, let it be your baseline, basically. It's like give yourself a floor and then build layers on top of it. Um, like I think anyone should still read it. I'd recommend it to people yep. for sure. Um, but as you mentioned, like then read the next thing, like Robert Kiyosaki's book you mentioned before, mm-hmm. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's a much better book because it teaches you principles that you can kind of expand upon. Yep. It's not just saying here's the tactics. And it just opens stick to your tactics. mind. It doesn't close it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. For sure. All right. And don't be afraid to have Oops. conversations about money. That's something that I think is so (coughs) crucial. The more you can have conversations about money, the more more willing you are to learn and to have an open mind about it as well. Uh, Awareness, insight, breakthrough. That's the the path. Mm. Create awareness around it. Gather the insight. That's where the breakthrough happens. Mm. I think that's the conversation. The conversation is the awareness. You can review, take the insight from that conversation, then go and make the breakthrough. Yep. Yeah. And make sure you're having the conversations with the right people as yeah, well. That's another one. Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, yeah. Um, there's great content out there now. Like I think podcasts, like we're doing right now, uh, and that's why we made it a focus for ourselves. Like it's such a great platform to be a fly on the wall to people having a good conversation or sharing a good message about mm-hmm. money, and then they'll talk with other people and they'll kind of debate what they think and what they the other person thinks, and you start to see the nuances with it and. Uh, it's such a good way to dial in in the way that people learn as well. We're great at learning through conversation. Mm. Sure. Absolutely. Investors Podcast, episode four in the books. Um, super appreciative. This is really new. So all of the support, we, we have been getting a lot of messages about this type of episode. So super grateful, especially for you guys coming in, joining us for this and, and also the guest episode that we did. Um, you know, good conversations, good people. A lot of learning for everyone involved and that's really what it's all about. So um, just remember to hit the subscribe button. Um, A big thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thanks.